I wanted to introduce Alan to you from Brainpool. I don't know how many people in the room know about our relationship with Brainpool, so I was just going to take two minutes to overview it to anyone who doesn't know. When we set up our machine learning practice six months ago, I think, in London, and started the development of the machine learning libraries, some of which you're going to be hearing about today, um, one of the things that was immediately obvious to us was, other than training our own workforce in the, the, the intricacies of machine learning, we had this demand from all of our customers, particularly finance, for immediate machine learning resource to help plug this gap between demand and supply. So we formed a relationship with an academic collective called Brainpool.ai. If you go to that site, you'll see all about them. It's around 253, I think, uh, machine learning graduates with various levels of PhDs and masters uh, and commercial experience. It's a startup that originated out of UCL uh, in London and contains brain poolers from UCL, Imperial Oxford, Cambridge, um, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Kaggle, Google. It's a bunch of people, very, very good at what they do. We sat down and started to train them all in KDB so that they could become certified to run machine learning projects as agents of KX. So they become essentially, they are allowed to wear the KX t-shirt. Um, they, can, they can be uh, uh, and, and taken on site under the standard KX terms and conditions. So we work really closely together. Brainpool are also facilitating the creation of our own educational resources for our grad intakes and so on uh, in, in line with our own full-time machine learning staff. So Alan kindly agreed to, to join us. We were going to introduce Paula Pardo, who runs all of the uh, academic side uh, of, of Brainpool in New York. Unfortunately, she was taken ill, so wasn't able to make it today. Alan kindly agreed to step in at last minute, uh, and obviously is, is a Brainpooler, uh, and is a principal machine learning engineer over at Capital One at the moment. So I, he's going to give some thoughts on what he's seeing in machine learning in finance at the moment. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Mark. And also, I just wanted to say what a privilege it is to be here celebrating KX's 25th with you all. Um, my name is Alan Rosette. As Mark mentioned, I'm a consultant over at BrainPool and also a principal machine learning engineer uh, over at Capital One. I'll be talking about some applications of machine learning in business and zeroing in on some that are more relevant to this crowd in the financial sphere. Just another quick summary of what BrainPool is, although Mark did a, a great job. So it's a pool of over 250 top-level data scientists uh, across the globe. And these are people with significant academic uh, expertise. So I'm from the one that's tucked away in the bottom right-hand corner called Harvard. Um, but we have people from all over the place. And really, the goal of BrainPool is to bridge the gap between academia and industry. So particularly in realms like machine learning, it can be the case that industry has the financial and technical resources to execute on high-cost research and business initiatives. Uh, while academia has the sort of diversity and rigor of thought necessary to drive those initiatives home uh, to the ending point. And so the combination of the two sort of spheres can be very powerful. And that's the gap that BrainPool is looking to bridge. So there won't be too many definitions in this talk. This will be relatively more high level, um, but there will be something interesting for the data scientists in the crowd as well, I do promise. Um, so machine learning, uh, if you haven't seen the you know, dozens and dozens and billions of news articles at this point about it, it's a field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So one of the crowning achievements of AI and machine learning in sectors like finance is the automation of processes that previously might have been manual and perhaps based on collective or tribal intuition within an organization or institution. Uh, so, for example, the use of filter-based strategies and handcrafted if-else decision trees can often be replaced with ones that have been learned from data and are more suited to your particular problem. What's enabled this change is not new algorithms, as many of the ones that we're using today were actually crafted decades ago, but it's more so factors like the sheer proliferation of data, uh, computational storage technologies and faster data processing that's made them tractable in, in the modern era. What that means for the market in terms of the speed of those changes and also the appeal of using machine learning is that uh, those changes have vastly outpaced the speed with which new uh, data scientists and machine learning experts 
uh, have acquired these skills and entered the talent market. Uh, so McKinsey estimates a 50% talent gap between the number of data scientists uh, that are available in the market and the requisite demand for data scientists uh, this year. At the same time, the AI market is growing from a, about a half a billion dollars in 2016 to the tens of billions of dollars uh, by 2025. We see these uh, increases in machine learning capability uh, distributed somewhat unevenly across the globe. So there's been a concentration of uh, ML and data science expertise in a few different countries like the US, the UK, China, and India. Uh, and that's both in terms of talent availability and also research effort. Uh, but not only is the, is the market rapidly expanding, this is also suggesting sort of an opportunity for the application of machine learning in all of the gray areas and emerging markets as well. I think this will be the only other set of definitions that I'll provide during this talk. Uh, so there are three major branches, branches of machine learning for those of you who haven't seen them before. Uh, the first is supervised learning, and it's typically the most commonly used branch, and it focuses on the forecasting and prediction of something known given a data set. So for example, if you're given a whole bunch of images of cats and dogs, you can train a model to tell you whether the image is of a cat or a dog. And then once you get new images in that do not have a label attached, um, your model will be able to give you a probability that the image is of either one. It's a relatively trivial problem, but we'll get to some exciting case studies in a little bit. Uh, unsupervised learning is similar to supervised learning, where we have the labels, uh, but in this case, you don't have names or labels in advance. So you can think of it as being given a data set of images of just furry animals uh, and asking a model to group the images by some kind of similarity metric. And the idea is to uncover some underlying structure in your data set and in some sense to apply labels to it. Finally, the third branch is reinforcement learning, uh, where often you're trying to optimize some kind of reward value. So you can think of this as a model that's learning to play chess, uh, where every piece that it's uh, taking away from the opposing player is netting it some kind of reward value, right? It's getting one point for the pawns and 10 points for the queens. Um, obviously, this is a very simplistic interpretation of chess. There's a lot more strategy involved, um, but that's, it's an easy conceptualization. So given those three very broad branches, you can imagine that there is uh, tons of applications of machine learning uh, across many different spheres. Um, one that's getting a lot of media attention today, and perhaps rightfully so, is self-driving cars. Um, and you can imagine how that fits into the case of supervised machine learning, right? So as the car is driving down the road, it's taking in images of its environment, it's seeing the lines on the road, uh, potentially pedestrians, and deciding at each moment, should I continue driving? Should I perhaps apply the brakes or switch to a, a, a remote operator, potentially? So often in, in, um, in machine, app, uh, machine learning applications, there may be a need to delve into human processes and have an interplay between people and algorithms. Uh, another one that I'll touch on here uh, that's also getting a lot of media attention is the incursion of machine learning into uh, creative and content production. So if you haven't seen it, Netflix has a very cool tech blog where they go into um, pretty um, pretty uh, interesting detail on a lot of their algorithms. So not only are they recommending the, um, the films and TV shows for you to watch, but they're even optimizing the title cards that are being presented to you on their website in terms of, let's say they have a, a set of five different title cards for a particular show. They'll optimize which actor they want to display based on what they think your personal click-through rate might look like. We can dive a little bit deeper and look at some ML applications in finance specifically. So fraud detection and prevention is a problem that's relevant to um, most uh, financial firms. So how do we identify bad actors, people who are likely uh, to default, and do we do that proactively, so perhaps at the point of purchase or looking forward, um, or do we do that retroactively, so after the transactions have been made, do we want to then audit those transactions? Risk management applications are often looking at how to optimize a portfolio, and they might be on an individual asset level. So for example, do I think that Amazon stock is likely to suddenly become more volatile? Um, it could also be framed in a sort of reinforcement learning framework, where our reward value is now very monetary, right? Um, we're looking at um, uh, decision making on how we allocate our asset mix. 
algorithmic trading is looking at a few similar ideas, but you can imagine that there's a lot of different ways to go about this. Um, and, and another option, like I was mentioning earlier, is the, the sort of interplay between human and algorithmic decision making. Often within algorithmic trading, you're just letting your algorithm run and obviously auditing it and making sure that it's running correctly. Um, but there are also uh, a mix between human and, and algorithmic uh, strategies. Finally, loan underwriting ties in closely with risk management, where we again want to assess how safe a loan is in terms of how likely the customer is to default, or perhaps take the loan at all and cash it out if we're working in a more competitive sphere, something like auto loans where there are a lot of different uh, contenders for uh, the, the customer's uh, money. So I'll now dive into a couple of case studies. Uh, the first one that I'll be jumping into is regarding credit card spend forecasting. So the problem here is given a customer and given their historical transactions, how do we predict their aggregate spend month to month? So you can imagine different uses for this uh, kind of forecast, including some of what I was mentioning earlier in terms of fraud detection and risk management. We also might have what type of category the spending uh, what type of category of spending the transaction was, uh, where the transaction occurred, and other data sources that we can pull in here. And aggregated across an entire organization, you can imagine how the, the size of this data escalates, right? So for a given customer, they may have something like 50 to 100 transactions per month, aggregated over months, and aggregated over millions, perhaps tens of millions of customers. You can imagine how this very quickly becomes a big data problem. So we might arrive at a forecast that looks something like this. Um, and a big part of this project when, when I was working on it in, in terms of my own expertise was using technologies like Spark for fast batch processing and also other back-end resources for model training that allowed us to use many instances uh, or servers at once for faster training. So this is the sort of supervised learning case where we're interested in predicting the future of a time series of transactions, in this case aggregate monthly spend for a customer. We can also look at the same problem in a slightly different sphere um, in terms of anomalous credit card spend detection or anomaly detection. So an uh, often, anomaly detection is very much a problem where you need a close interplay between humans and your machine learning model. So what kind of signaling do you want in anticipation of an anomalous event or once one has happened uh, in terms of who should be alerted? And how might that change depending on your consumer segment? So for example, if uh, the new Tickle Me Elmo just came out and suddenly tons of consumers are purchasing it. Uh, they have this new random spend of $100. Um, is that truly an anomaly and should they be alerted? Whereas if it's a small business customer and they have a typical spend of $10,000 and it suddenly jumps to 100000 or a million, what should that alerting look like? Which department should be notified? And how should we let the customer know? So this is just a, a graph that I whipped up in Excel to you know, very <laughs> grossly demonstrate the problem. Um, and also forecasting and anomaly detection can be intimately tied in the proactive case. So to, to flip back for a second, you can imagine that if we're good at making that forecast on the right side, if our confidence intervals were a little bit more narrow, you can imagine that we can simply characterize something that falls outside of that range as probably anomalous. Uh, but that's for the proactive case. For the, ret the, uh, the uh, retroactive case, we can also audit historical transactions. Uh, movie clustering analysis for audience segmentation and also ad targeting. Uh, this is a project that I worked on uh, for a personal startup. Um, and the, the goal here is um, assuming that customer uh, consumers have some kind of interest in uh, genres of movies or perhaps uh, characterizations of movies that might be more nebulous than genre, and assuming that consumers, based on those preferences, may engage uh, uh, differentially with uh, ads, perhaps we can cater ads based on movie preferences. So this is the uh, more unsupervised learning case. Uh, so if we have an understanding of where a movie falls in terms of taste and genre, and we have an understanding of what content the, movie, the viewers of particular movies tend to engage with, then we can target advertising campaigns accordingly. So here we just have a bunch of dots, assuming these correspond to movies. Some may be in the documentary sphere, others may be comedies, and others may be action movies. But these groupings may not necessarily correspond to a human interpretable uh, understanding. 
so once we've built that kind of mapping between films and, um, and viewer preferences in terms of different uh, consumer interests, we can start doing better ad targeting. So this is an analysis that we built at my company. Um, so on the left side, you'll see various categories of different interests. And the bars to the right of the categories are showing baseline levels of interest in those categories, in addition to how we expected viewers of the particular film to engage with content of that type. So you'll see that there are um, media outlets such as IndieWire or Entertainment Weekly on the bottom, uh, BuzzFeed News as well. And so the, the expectation is that we, if we uh, know what viewers are interested in, we can better target ads to them. I'm running low on time. Uh, I will work fast through this last case study. Um, so this is uh, personalized stress prediction using electronic health record data. Um, so healthcare is a really interesting case in that you have tons of sources of data, right? Triage information, MD comments, specialist consultations, and these are all taken the form of not only text, but also images. Um, some of these are continuous time series like repeated vital signs, uh, self-reports of attitude and stress. Um, so the goal, this is a collaboration with Columbia Medical Center. Um, perhaps for Jane on the left side, she gets really stressed out about her job and how much money she's making. Um, and perhaps for John, he also gets stressed out by his job, but also about the weather outside. So we can also use machine learning to understand what is motivating a model and how it's making its predictions. And in general, this is a, a much longer topic that might merit its own talk. Uh, but explainable machine learning is also um, a sort of subfield. So how can you get started with some of these problems? Uh, BrainPool offers AI and business workshops that help you understand what's unique about your particular data source and how machine learning teams can collaborate, generate features for your particular problem. We also offer an AI consultancy package where, you, where it's the case where you might be limited in technical resources and we help you accelerate from a business use case and an idea to a proof of concept. We also offer access to AI experts and talent matching for someone that you can then hire and manage yourself full time. And then finally, we offer ongoing AI support where regardless of the arrangement, BrainPool can make uh, expertise available to you. So if you're interested in any of those packages or interested in learning more about any of the case studies, feel free to get in touch with us at contact at brainpool.ai. And thank you so much. <laughs>